Good evening, good morning, depending on where you are, everyone. Um, my name's Mark Sargent, I'm EC Science Program Manager, and for the last time in this series on Captivating Cosmology, your host, the next two seminars, the remaining two in the series will then be hosted by Maurizio next week and in the following week. So today we have the pleasure of having Tracy Slat here with us. Um, Tracy is currently a professor at MIT, uh, and uh, yeah, her research area is very much in line with what she will be speaking about today. So there's a reason why we asked her to be with us today. Uh, Tracy is an expert on dark matter and dark matter signatures, especially in observational data. So uh, very much in line with the remit of this series to think about the, the astrophysics also of, of the various cosmological and universe constituents. So yeah, a few words about Tracy's background. Um, Tracy did her undergraduate degree in Australia before then moving to the US for the rest of her career. She did her PhD in uh, physics in, at Harvard, um, graduated from Harvard in 2010, then moved to Princeton to the Inst Institute of Advanced Study. And after three years there, began her faculty, her current faculty position at MIT. So since moving to MIT um, and reflecting the work she has done throughout her career, uh, Tracy has been awarded a couple of prestigious prizes. So for instance, the New Horizons in Physics Award uh, in 2021, and two years before that in 2019, the Presidential Early, Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. To do also with some of the work she will be showing us today, I understand. <laughs> So we're looking forward to that. Um, let me just remind you, if you're joining uh, a Game Changer seminar for the first time today, how you can then ask your questions. So you have two opportunities or two channels to do so. You can either post your question already during the presentation in the chat, in the Zoom chat, or you can wait until the end and raise your hand, whereupon we'll switch back and forth between questions coming through through the chat and also uh, people who have raised their hand. So yeah, Tracy, um, you, you're going to treat us to a talk called Light from Darkness, which is not only a metaphor, but could almost be. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to what you have to tell us about dark matter searches. So yeah, the stage is yours. Thanks. Go Thanks ahead. very much for the invitation, Mark, and for the very kind introduction. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here to today to talk to you all about dark matter. And my work is supported by the Office of Science at the US Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation through the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. All right. So let me jump right in. Where I want to, I know that not everybody here works on dark matter or thinks about it. So I want to begin by talking about this big problem of dark matter, what we think we know about it, and some open questions. Then I'm going to try to just go through a bit the tour de force astrophysical and cosmological observations that teach us what we think we know about dark matter and also what questions they leave open. Then in the latter part of the talk, I'll talk about how we can look for non-gravitational interactions of dark matter going below, beyond the gravitational probes that have already taught us quite a bit about dark matter. And uh, that I'll, I'll say a little bit about the status of some of those searches, about things we're seeing that we don't understand, and where we go from here. All right, but so let's begin with the big question that we are trying to answer, which is what is the dark matter of the universe? So what do we mean when we say dark matter? Well, we have pretty good evidence that there is some new component of the universe which makes up about 84% of the matter in the universe by mass, and it has mass and hence gravitates, but at least it doesn't scatter, emit, or absorb light at a level we have currently detected. So in fact, transparent matter might be a better word than dark matter, but dark has a history at this point. So the phrase dark matter is a placeholder for our ignorance in some ways. Dark just means doesn't interact significantly with light. Matter just means it has mass and it gravitates. And those two qualities are you know, how, how, and so it's gravitational pull on visible matter is how we've learned almost everything we know about dark matter. But we also have conducted a lot of searches for non-gravitational interactions between dark matter and visible particles and so far we have not seen any signals in them. So that leads to this other statement that if dark matter interacts with other particles that we already know about, it does so weakly or not at all, 
except by gravity. And for reasons that I'll explain to you, this is enough to say that dark matter can't be explained by any physics that we currently understand. So that leaves open many open questions which occupy my interest and that of many other scientists, such as what is this stuff made from? Is it a new particle? Is it many new particles? Is it tiny black holes left over from the very early universe? Where did it come from? Where is this 84% number from? Does it actually interact with ordinary particles? We haven't detected those interactions yet except through gravity, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not there. If so, what are the nature of those interactions? And I could keep going for a long time. So that's the general stage, but let me first, you know, talk a bit about how we got to the information on the we know it side of the board, and then I'll go on and talk about how we're trying to answer these open questions. So the first clues of dark matter and the word dark matter go back to the 1920s and 1930s, and in particular in 1933, an astronomer named Fritz Wicke was trying to measure the mass of the coma cluster of galaxies, and there's a pretty picture of part of the coma cluster here in this image. So if you want to know how much mass there is in a galaxy cluster, you, you know, cannot go out there with scales. We're stuck on Earth. You have to do everything by observation of astrophysical and cosmological that you might was to number of total galaxies and try to estimate the mass of each galaxy and add them together. And the second method was to say, okay, well, we know that gravity is associated with mass. We can measure these galaxies again to measure the gravitational forces on them. And from that, we can infer how much mass there is in the cluster. So, you know, this seems like two good methods. They can cross-check each other. Unfortunately, when you do the cal when Zwicky did the calculation or when we do the calculation today, the two methods give very different results. Zwicky found that the second gave an answer about 500 times larger than the first method. So that's, uh, that's a little surprising. That suggests that there might be, well, a few things could be, there could be something wrong with your calculation. Um, there could be something wrong with your theory of gravity, or there could just be a lot of mass in this galaxy cluster that you're not capping just by counting the individual galaxies. So that was noted in the 1930s. Wiki talked talk about the third hypothesis and called it dark matter. At this point, he wasn't thinking about some kind of new particle, just you know, matter that wasn't showing up um, in, the, in observations of the cluster, non-luminous matter. And then I think that this problem was not really it, it was it was a, a known issue, uh, but not sort of seen as any indication of new physics for many decades. And then the next major clue sort of showed up around the 1970s, when a number of groups, including Vera Rubin and her collaborators, tried to measure the rotation speed of stars and gas clouds in galaxies. And so here we have just at the bottom of this page, we have just like a little cartoon. The yellow dot is indicating sort of the central luminous region of the galaxy. And then these smaller dots around it are going to indicate tracer particles that are orbiting the galaxy. So what you would expect to see just from Newtonian gravity is that closer into the center of the galaxy, gravity is stronger, the particles orbit faster, the same way that planets closer into the sun orbit faster around the sun than the ones further out. And as you go out to larger distances, the orbital velocity gets much smaller. But in fact, what was observed is that the velocity of these particles doesn't really slow down as you go to larger radii for a long way. We say that the rotation curve is flat and actually these particles are orbiting the inner part of the, these, dis, these distant traces. We're not talking about individual parts here, but about stars or gas clouds are orbiting the galaxy with about the same speed as you have in. So again, this could suggest some kind of modification to your theory of gravity, some kind of error in your measurements, but it shows up consistently in a lot of galaxies. Or it could suggest there is extra gravitating mass in the outskirts of the galaxy. So that while there's a bright luminous region at the center, the mass in the galaxy extends out much further. So under that hypothesis, that would suggest that there is some new dark in the sense that we don't see it glowing um, in radiation, uh, a new dark form of mass in the outer parts of galaxies. So in this picture, we have, again, the luminous part at the center, a dark halo surrounding it. The different distribution would also suggest in this case that the dark matter behaves differently to ordinary matter in important ways. In particular, it hasn't collapsed into a spiral galaxy like the ordinary matter has. So you can ask, why would that be so? Well, one hypothesis that works is if the dark matter doesn't interact with radiation. Part of the thing that allows the ordinary matter to collapse down into a galaxy is that it can radiate off 
um, photons, it can shed energy and angular momentum through radiation. If the dark matter doesn't do that and doesn't have any electromagnetic interactions, then you don't then you, you don't expect a collapse, or at least you expect the collapse to take much longer. Okay, so that's one hypothesis, but there could be other hypotheses that work. One that's gotten much attention over the years is maybe there's some change to gravity. Maybe gravity is different on galactic scales and doesn't weaken as quickly as expected with distance. So you might ask, all right, how can we tell that apart from dark matter? And this is actually kind of a challenging problem because dark matter and luminous matter are gravitationally attracted to each other. We see regions of high dark matter density in, as measured by its gravitational pull in regions where there's a lot of ordinary matter already. And this is exactly what you would expect because they're gravitationally attracted to each other. So in equilibrium, they're going to collect in the same places. So a solution to this is look at non-equilibrium systems where galaxy clusters are colliding with each other. And so if we collide two clouds of gas with each other, we smash them into each other, then forces that then they, they will they will act on each other through electromagnetic forces. The gas will get compressed as these gas clouds run into each other, and the gas clouds will heat it, the colliding gas clouds will heat each other up, and that can produce X-ray radiation. So, and this is a famous example of a colliding galaxy cluster called the Bullock Cluster. This red highlighting is the image shining in x-rays and you can see where these gas clouds have run into each other, they've exerted pressure on each other, um, they've heated each other up and are now glowing in x-rays. And this is called the bullet cluster in analogy to images like this one where you have a bullet passing through a fluid, this galaxy cluster has rammed through the gas cloud of the other one and that's distorted its shape. So in a system like this, you might ask, okay, let's suppose that each of these clouds of gas had a cloud of dark matter associated with it initially in the collision. Then what happened to that dark matter when they collided? Well, if we're working on this hypothesis that the reason dark matter forms large halos rather than collapsing down into spiral galaxies is that it has no collisions or very small or very um, low collisionality compared to ordinary matter, then the clouds of dark matter shouldn't run into each other and exert pressure on each other and heat each other up. They should just go straight through each other. So and I'm going to show a little cartoon of that here. So here we're imagining two colliding clusters. Red indicates ordinary matter, blue indicates dark matter. So the blue is treated here as being collisionless. It can only interact through gravity. The red is treated as being collisional. It can, when these gas clouds run into each other, they're going to exert forces on each other and heat each other up. And when they heat each other up and exert forces on each other, they're also going to slow each other down. So that means that in such a collision, the blue clouds of dark matter will just keep flying off happily on their way. The gas clouds, due to the drag force that they exert on each other, will slow each other down. So in this case, we could potentially hope to separate the gravitational effects of dark matter from the, um, from the visible X-ray glow of the visible matter. And that's exactly the analysis that was done uh, by a team in 2006 where they used gravitational lensing. So they looked at the, uh, how the light from background stars was distorted by the mass that's in the way and used that to measure the total mass in, these, in, in, these region, uh, in, in this region around the bullet cluster. And the blue highlighting here is showing where they found the largest concentrations of mass were, whereas the red highlighting is again showing uh, where they saw most of the X-rays coming from. So the interpretation of this result, or at least the classic interpretation, is that these blue regions indicate most of the mass in the cluster, the dark matter halos, which have just flown through each other and kept going, and whereas the red indicates the ordinary matter that has been left behind. And this is actually pretty hard to explain by modifying gravity, because you know, even if you say that gravity falls off at a, different, uh, at a different rate than you had expected, it still should be true that the gravity is in the regions where the mass is. If the ordinary matter is all in the center, it's very hard to explain why its gravitational effects would be over here. So this was viewed by many people in the field as a smoking gun for dark matter. There's also another really central piece of evidence for dark matter that is hard to explain by modifications to gravity, although perhaps not impossible, which is observations of the cosmological effects of dark matter on the history of our universe. So to look at this, we have to go back in time a bit to when the universe was only about 400,000 years old. Now our universe is expanding over time and cooling over time. So in the early universe, it was much hotter and much denser. And when it was less than about 400,000 years old, we believe it was a hot and nearly perfectly uniform, smooth soup of light and atoms and presumably also dark matter. 
So well, I've written it as light and atoms here, but actually that's not quite right. Before about um, before this time when the universe was less than 400,000 years old, there, there were no hydrogen atoms because the temperature of the universe was hot enough to keep them in an ionized plasma state. So really it was light, electrons, um, and, and protons. And there were, and however, this so this primordial plasma was not perfectly uniform. There were oscillating ripples in the temperature and density of that. And we think those actually arose from the very earliest moments of the universe um, in the epoch that we call inflation. But we can observe them directly in, uh, in, in images from the universe at this early time. So yeah, what, why, how can we take images of this world? So when the, at around, at, when the universe was around 400,000 years old, the temperature dropped to the point that now this plasma could form into hydrogen atoms. And that released the photons to free stream to the present day because photons are good at scattering on charged particles, but not so good at scattering on neutral particles. So the path length for these photons abruptly leapt to the size of the universe and photons emitted at that time, many of them have never scattered on anything else until like they meet our telescopes in the present day. And we call that radiation the cosmic microwave background. And this upper plot is a very beautiful picture of what that cosmic microwave background radiation looks like across the sky. You can see these little regions where the intensity is lower or higher, corresponding to differences in the temperature and density of the plasma in that very early universe. Now we can parametrize a map like this by looking at the amount of power in these fluctuations as a function of their size on the sky. You can think of this kind of like it's like measuring the intensity of sound at different frequencies. When we, when we do this measurement, we see that there are peaks in the power at certain frequencies. And you can think of these as like resonant frequencies. As the early universe, they're related to the, the size of the cosmos and the distance the sound travels at that early time. OK, so how does this tell us about dark matter? The pattern of these fluctuations depends on how much dark matter you have relative to ordinary matter. Because what's governing the oscillation of these ripples in the early universe is gravity on one hand and radiation pressure on the other. If I have a region that is higher density than other regions, then its gravity will cause other particles to accrete to it, to fall onto it. And so I would expect that density to get uh, larger as a function of time. But when I try to cram a lot of plasma together in a small region, radiation pressure um, will push the particles away from each other and tend to reduce the density. So you can think of this as kind of like a, a system of interconnected springs. It's the physics of, um, of a spring or a pendulum or a simple harmonic oscillator. And the relative strength of these two effects depends on the degree to which the matter interacts with gravity on one hand and with radiation pressure on the other hand. And if you just say, all right, let's assume that all the matter in the universe interacts with gravity and with radiation pressure in the way that we understand from protons and electrons and all the particles that we know about, you get a really poor match to the data. So this plot on the right is showing what this power spectrum would look like if you just had the visible matter in the universe. And you know, it's, it's quite different from what we see. But you can add but especially if you have this evidence from the present day that there appears to be this component that maybe doesn't interact in the same way that ordinary matter does, you can imagine adding a dark component to the universe that doesn't feel radiation pressure, only, it only feels gravity. And so this effectively dials up the strength of gravity relative to the radiation pressure, and doing that changes the power spectrum in a distinctive way. So this cartoon is showing as you change the amount of dark matter in the universe, how this pattern of power in the oscillations changes. And it turns out to the match the data, we need a dark matter component with about five times more total mass than the ordinary matter. So that's where this 84% of matter in the universe comes from. So that, I think, is sort of the thing that most people in the field currently consider the most compelling evidence for dark matter. Now, those ripples in that cosmic microwave background called the CMB also map out the initial conditions for structure to form later in the cosmos. Those regions where the gas density is just a little bit higher than others, as time goes on, they grow under the influence of gravity, they accrete more matter to them. And the structure that forms, we believe, is a sort of filamentary cosmic web with regions of high density at intersections of the web. This picture is from a simulation by the illustrious collaboration of this process. And since dark matter is most of the mass in the is most of the matter in the universe by mass, it is the primary constituent of this cosmic web. Now, the formation of this cosmic web relies on the dark matter being relatively slow moving. If dark matter was hot and traveling close to the speed of light, dark matter particles would stream past each other very rapidly, and it would actually be very difficult for them to form into these gravitationally bound structures. 
Now, how we believe it works is that this cosmic web forms and then the ordinary matter just follows the dark matter around due to its gravity. Regions of high dark matter density will attract ordinary matter to it. And then in those regions of high ordinary matter density, stars can form and galaxies can form. And that's why galaxies are surrounded by dark matter halos because dark matter halos are the cradles of galaxy formation. If these dark matter halos didn't form, if the dark matter was too fast moving and just streamed through the universe and never formed this web, then galaxies would not form when we know that they do. They would form much later in the universe's history. So that doesn't match the data. So this both tells us, it gives us a picture of the universe where behind the night sky that we see, there is this scaffolding of invisible dark matter that is most of the mass in the universe and is responsible for its large scale structure. And it tells us something about how the dark matter behaves, that it has to be relatively cold and slow moving so that the dark matter particles can accrete into these clumps and filaments that grow over time. These small clumps combine to form streams and halos. And this gives us a description of the universe that looks very much like what we see today. All right, so that's the evidence for dark matter or from cosmological and astrophysical data sets. And so then we can ask, all right, what makes up this dark matter? What's it comprised of? And we don't have any good answers within the particle physics that we already understand. We need, if we're going to explain this with some kind of new particle, we need the particle to be stable on cosmological timescales. So the dark matter was around when the universe is 400,000 years old and is still around today. It needs to be close to collisionless, which means it had better not have any kind of electric charge unless it's a super, super tiny charge. Um, it has to be pretty slow moving. We have upper limits on how fast it can move. And when we look at particles that could do this in the standard model, they're only like stable neutral particles and neutrinos. And neutrinos are too light and too fast moving to be the dark matter. They would not form this cosmic web in the way that we observe. Now, so we need something. Now there's some possibility that we could, that the dark matter particles themselves could be something that we already know can exist, such as tiny black holes left over from the early universe. But those tiny black holes would be need to be formed very early in the universe. And that would require some physics beyond what we currently understand. So, you know, anyway, you probably, dark matter is telling you something about physics that we don't currently understand. It's one of our most powerful pieces of evidence for physics beyond the standard model. But everything we've learned about dark matter so far has come from studying its gravitational pull on ordinary matter. So, so where does that leave us? So I took this cartoon from Wikipedia about like the scientific method as an ongoing process. And so there are two, there are two, so, and there are sort of two stages of this process for dark matter. The first process is, the first part of this process was just formulating the hypothesis that something like dark matter exists. We observed, massive we observed massive galaxy clusters and rotation curves. This led to the field to think about questions like, okay, well, what's causing these discrepancies? What's going on here? One hypothesis would be additional matter that doesn't really interact with light, that doesn't feel radiation pressure. That allows you to make predictions to, that you would see gravitational effects even when there's no visible matter around as in the bullet cluster and you would modify cosmology. Those predictions have been spectacularly verified with observations of the causing microwave background of structure later in the universe and of cluster observations. And so this leads us to our current standard model of cosmology, the Lambda CDM theory, which says that about 84% of the matter in the universe is dark matter. You know, so in some sense, people will sometimes say we're looking to discover dark matter, but there's a sense in which we have already discovered dark matter. You know, we, we have pulled together all these pieces of evidence and we now have a pretty like well corroborated hypothesis that there is something out there in the universe that behaves in the way that I have described. But then there's the question, okay, but, but what is making up that component? And there we're at a much earlier stage. We have all these observations that dark matter appears to be present, but, and then there are many interesting questions, some of which I listed earlier, you know, is this a new particle? Does it interact at all except by gravity? How heavy, you know, how, what, what is its mass? Can it decay? Like, does it have some finite lifetime? Is it connected to other fundamental puzzles um, of science? And so then we get, when we get to the formulate hypotheses stage, there are lots of possibilities for what this could be. This is uh, an image from a talk by my colleague, Tim Tate, as part of the snow mass process that the field went through about 10 years ago. I do not want you to read everything on this slide. Um, but, but the sketch is that everything within the red line is an idea of class of models for what dark matter could possibly be. And everything outside the red line is a broader idea in, uh, for new physics that could be connected to the dark matter puzzle. So dark matter could be connected to some kind of new symmetry of the universe, like supersymmetry. If our universe has additional dimensions beyond the three space dimensions and one time dimension, 
that we normally think about. Dark matter could be related to that. It could be related to puzzles of the Higgs sector in the standard model. It could be some kind of heavy, slower moving neutrino, some kind of sterile neutrino. We have outstanding puzzles in the strong interactions of the standard model, in particular, the, the lack of a property called CP violation, which we would have naively expected to see. Well, dark matter could be involved in the solution to that problem. Dark matter could even interact through its own forces that we don't know about in the same way that visible particles interact through electromagnetism and dark matter does not, in which case dark matter would be our best key into a whole new, into, into whole new forces of nature. So um, it, it, there's a lot of potentially exciting stuff to learn, but there are three things that I want you to take away from this slide. So one is that Indeed, dark matter could be connected to a whole plethora of puzzles in physics beyond the standard model. In addition to just figuring out what dark matter is for its own sake, it's 84% of the matter in the universe, so it would be nice to know what it is. It could potentially be the key to unlock a lot of other puzzles. So it would be great if we could figure out what it is. The second thing is that we don't have any shortage of ideas for what it could be. The problem here is not that we have no viable ways to explain this puzzle. The problem is that we have many viable ways to explain this puzzle, and at present, all of them are consistent with the data. So that is the third point, that in order to distinguish these scenarios, because at the end of the day, probably at most one thing on this page is the answer to what is the bulk of the dark matter in the universe. If we wanna be able to distinguish these, um, we need new handles on the problem. And one handle that there's a very large experimental program to look for is, what if there is some interaction that is not gravitational between dark matter and visible matter? If we could find that, if we could find a positive detection of that, it would immediately allow us to eliminate the vast majority of possibilities. Okay, okay. so it's just saying what I just said. There's a huge range of viable scenarios for dark matter. There are lots of good models. The problem's not that we don't have any ideas for this. We have too many. Um, and you know, ju just as a handle, you some of these scenarios correspond to dark matter that's 20 orders of magnitude lighter than a neutrino. Some of it corresponds to dark matter where the individual particles are the masses of asteroids. So there's an enormous range of possibilities that are all perfectly consistent with current data, but they often predict very different interactions between dark matter and ordinary particles, and sometimes also different interactions between dark matter particles. So if we could detect those interactions, it would give us a really powerful handle to distinguish between these models or, or tell us that it's something we haven't thought of yet. So there's a big program of those searches for dark matter interactions with many complementary search strategies. This is sort of one standard classification that in many dark matter scenarios, if dark matter particles collide with each other, you could potentially produce standard model particles. So here's CHI stands for the dark matter, SM stands for something in the standard model. This sort of blue blob in the center stands for the interaction between the standard model particles that is currently a mystery, but, but we would like to be able to detect or constrain. So indirect, in indirect detection experiments, which is going to be the focus of the remainder of my talk, the idea is that dark matter particles colliding with each other out in space could produce visible particles that we can look for in telescopes. Dark matter particles could also bounce off standard model particles, causing them, causing them to jitter around. So this is sort, sort of like Brownian motion telling you about atomic physics. Um, in these, these experiments are often called direct detection experiments because you're looking for the dark matter to interact directly with the known particles within your detector. Or at accelerators, you can flip this and say, well, if particles and we can signatures. That's not an exhaustive list. There are dark matter scenarios where in the presence of a general magnetic field, dark matter convert into a visible particle, usually a photon or vice versa. So that's called an oscillation signal. And there's, there are lots of really cool searches for that, both astrophysical and cosmological and terrestrial. In some cases, dark matter could actually be absorbed onto visible matter. And so that's another thing you can search for. So this is not exhaustive, but, um, but it's sort of a good, it has a funny model, which is that you can think about the dark matter, uh, you, you can break it, or you can shake, you can break it when it smashes into each other, you can shake it, you can shake the visible matter with the dark matter, or you can try to make it at accelerators. So but in particular, since I was asked to talk about cosmological and astrophysical signatures of dark matter, I'm going to focus on this first category and other cosmological and astrophysical constraints, remembering that like everything we've already learned about dark matter has come from these observations, and it turns out that they can also uh, shed a lot of light on non-gravitational interactions. Okay, so what are, what are some, so let's talk about some of those possible signatures. It will not be an exhaustive list just because I have limited time, but let's, but let me give you a flavor of some of the things that you might hope to see. 
So we talked about dark matter particles collide, making visible particles on the previous slide. Well, dark matter could also decay just with a very long lifetime that is longer than the age of the universe. And in that case, again, there would be some mystery interaction, which we're trying to probe, which is the question mark here. But the output of either decay or collisions would be the same, that you produce some visible particles in the standard model, which could be quarks or leptons or gauge bosons. Once produced, those particles may be unstable and may decay. Most of the particles in the standard model are unstable. So on a timescale that is usually pretty quick compared to astrophysical or cosmological timescales, the particles produced by these interactions uh, would decay away to the stable particles that we know about, such as photons, neutrinos, protons, electrons, and their antiparticles. And so the goal of indirect detection is to look for those particles or their secondary effects, and then from that reconstruct what these standard models particles were in the decay and then reconstruct from that this, this, you know, this, this is the prize, the information about the properties of the dark matter and the interaction between dark matter and the standard model. Or if you don't see anything, put limit on that. And again, these are not the only possibilities. It doesn't have to be decay or annihilation. Photons convert to dark matter particles and escape from regions where they would, would otherwise be trapped. Um, there are scenarios where like light from supernovae could effectively cause the dark matter particles to undergo stimulated emission and create photons. If there are cases of where dark matter could actually form bound states around colliding black holes with interesting effects on gravitational wave signatures. So there are lots of things that you could look for, but I'll do some examples just dealing with these decay or annihilation scenarios. So if something like decay or annihilation happened, what that would mean is it's a way to take mass stored, energy stored in the mass of the dark matter and convert it into visible radiation and particles that we can look for. And it turns out that even a tiny fraction of dark matter interacting through these non-gravitational channels, what it would mean is that through our universe's whole history, there has been a slow and steady trickle of energy into visible particles coming from energy stored in the dark matter. And that would modify the history of the universe in some pretty striking ways. So this is a cartoon of the history of the universe. I've circled the emission of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is about the 400,000 year mark that we talked about. But after the cosmic microwave background radiation is emitted, the universe goes through a period where it is composed largely of hydrogen and helium gas. It's neutral, it's quiet, it's dark. And this period is called the cosmic dark ages. And it ends when the universe is around 100 million years old and the first stars start to turn on in a process that we call cosmic dawn because it was the first sunrise. But during this period, this quiet cosmic dark ages, there weren't any stars, there weren't any galaxies, but the dark matter was there. And if this annihilation or decay process was happening, it would have been happening in this epoch. So let's just think a little bit about what, what that power could do. Well, we know that E equals MC squared. There's a lot of energy stored in the dark matter mass. For every, there's about five times as much energy as in the mass of the ordinary matter. So that means that for every hydrogen atom in the universe, there's about 5 GeV of energy stored in dark matter or about 10 to the minus nine joules. Now, 10 to the minus nine joules seems like a pretty small number, but there's that much for every single hydrogen atom. If we were to convert just one billionth of that into visible radiation via annihilation or decay, that's about five EV per hydrogen atom. That's enough to split half the hydrogen atoms in the universe into electrons and protons. It's also enough to heat up every hydrogen atom in the universe by roughly 50,000 degrees Kelvin. We would have noticed if these things had happened. And it turns out that by observations of the cosmic microwave background as it passes through these, uh, through these cosmic dark ages where there's not a lot of backgrounds from stars and astrophysics, we can actually test scenarios where only around one trillionth of the dark matter in that epoch is converted into visible signals. In particular, that means that you know, this is a current status statement that we can actually probe dark matter decaying with a lifetime about 10 to the eight times the current age of the universe. So and any lifetimes shorter than that, uh, if dark matter decayed into visible particles, we would have already seen the signals. And that's true for an enormous range of particle masses spanning about 20 orders of magnitude from dark matter hundreds of times lighter than an electron all the way up to the Planck scale. So this is one of the things that you can do with this kind of observation. Another question that you might ask is, okay, if this annihilation was going on, if these collisions were going on producing visible particles or the dark matter was decaying, producing visible particles, what you would expect to see more generally is extra visible particles coming from regions of high matter density. So you can say, all right, let's look, go out and look with telescopes at regions of high dark matter density throughout the universe and uh, see what we can see. So can we see additional photons? Now, the difficulty here 
is that as we discussed earlier, regions of high dark matter density are also where galaxies live. That's where galaxies are formed. That's where a lot of the ordinary matter is. So there tend to be backgrounds. Regions of high dark matter density can also produce um, high energy particles in a lot of other ways. So in particular, a target that you might think is a great target is the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. That's the center of our dark matter halo. The density is highest there. It's nice and close to us since we're inside the Milky Way galaxy. So we can go look for a dark matter signal from that region. But there's a background in the way because we live in a galaxy and that produces, so there are stars that can produce light. Well, our galaxy is also a sea of charged particles called cosmic rays. And when those particles interact with gas clouds in the Milky Way, they produce high energy radiation, which is a background. So this is a picture just of like, so, so this is a picture of our galaxy stretched out onto a rectangle. Um, the plane of the galaxy, the plane of the Milky Way, which if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you can see looking up at the stars at night, is this band along the center of the image. The center of the Milky Way is in the very center. And all this sort of bright orange and white and red region corresponds to gas clouds surrounding our galaxy that are being lit up and illuminated by high energy charge particles smashing into them. Okay, so that's the background. What would a dark matter signal look like if you had dark matter annihilation or decay? So there are a few distinguishing possible features of a dark matter signal. First is that the picture here would be dark matter particles crashing together, making visible particles which decay um, to make photons, among other things. That means that the characteristic energy of the particles that you produce is determined by the amount of energy in the dark matter mass via E equals mc squared again. So that means that if we look at the distribution of these output particles as a function of energy, we expect there to be a peak at a characteristic scale, which is controlled by the dark matter mass and also the masses of the standard model particles that it annihilates into. So this is an example for dark matter with a mass of about 30 times the mass of the proton. Uh, and this is the spectrum of gamma rays that you would get out. So the y-axis here is the power in gamma rays per logarithmic interval in energy. And the x-axis is the energy in our giga electron volts. Like just for calibration, for those who don't think about these units that often, the visible light in this room has an energy of about one electron volt. So this is about a billion. So here we're looking at high energy photons, gamma rays, which are about a billion times more energetic than visible light. But we actually have fantastic telescopes that can look across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So if I, if I told you that I wanted to look for 30 MeV dark matter instead or 30 KeV dark matter, we would also be able to look for photons produced by particles um, that, that are generated when dark matter particles collide or decay. So this is a hypothetical signal, but this is a kind of structure that we would expect to see that there's some kind of scale in, in the energy spectrum. You can see that all these have kind of a bump like shape. The other thing that you can do is say, well, going back to our cartoon where there's a big dark cloud of dark matter surrounding our galaxy, we would expect the backgrounds to look like the, to, to follow the distribution of the stars and gas. Mm -hmm. And as we saw in this previous image, like the background is much brighter along the galactic plane, but the dark matter signal should be more spherical corresponding to this cloud-like dark matter halo that we're in. So we can say, all right, let's try to model this background from the Milky Way. And then let's see if there's any evidence for a signal with these properties on top of it. So this was done about 10 years ago. This particular image is coming from data from the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which is one of the ensemble of awesome gamma ray telescopes that look for dark matter and other, phys and other you know, exciting physics in the sky. This is a little picture of Fermi. So when Fermi looked at the sky and looked at the inner galaxy and this analysis was done, we did actually find something. So these panels on the left are showing in three different energy bands, the total emission that you see from looking at the galactic center region with Fermi. And then the right is what's left after you subtract off a model for the background emission. And it's just this little blob in the center of the galaxy. So you know, might say that doesn't look that impressive, but actually if you work out the probability that you that this little blob is just a statistical fluctuation on the background, it's it's extremely uh, I can tell you what people want, but it it's really small. So how this varies as a function it has and it's towards the center of the galaxy, which you might expect from dark matter annihilations and collisions. And it extends out to about 10 degrees from the center of the galaxy, which is nearly 5,000 light years. It may extend beyond that. We just can't measure it very well because it gets too faint. And it looks roughly spherical. And the brightness is actually what exactly what you would expect from a very standard and well-studied class of dark matter models. 
So you, know, you look at this as many of us did uh, when this was first discovered and say, wow, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the dark matter signal. So now we get to the, okay, let's, we've got some observations, let's formulate some hypotheses again. So the, every particle theorist's favorite explanation for this is we're seeing dark matter annihilation. Like this could be it. This could be the fundamental you know, insight into what 84% of the matter in the universe is. However, there's another hypothesis or a class of other hypotheses, which is that this is telling us about some conventional astrophysics that we don't understand in the galactic center that doesn't require new physics beyond the standard model. So in particular, this could be telling us about some large new population of stars or other point sources. And the most discussed candidate for that is millisecond pulsars, which are spinning neutron stars that whip around at about a thousand times a second. The other possibility is that they you know, I told you that you, you get um, high energy photon emission from charged cosmic rays interacting with the gas. Something like that could be happening. Maybe there's some outflow of high energy charged particles from the galactic center, which is lighting up the gas in the region and giving rise to this extra blob of emission. Under each of these possibilities, particle theorists would be a little sad, but it would be really exciting from the perspective of an astrophysicist, um, because this would be telling us stuff about the history of our galaxy and the behavior of our galactic center that we didn't know about before. So then of course, the key question and the key challenge for this exercise, which is an ongoing challenge, is distinguishing the two from each other. And this is just one example of a broader principle. There are other excesses like this, other things that we currently don't understand in the data. So understanding the astrophysics with data sets across the whole electromagnetic spectrum and from uh, char looking at charged particles and looking at gravitational waves is an essential ingredient for trying to figure out what these data sets are actually telling us about dark matter. There's also an interesting thing here that I can talk about if people are interested, those of you who think about statistics and computation, there's quite a lot of attempts to develop new tools in this space, including artificial intelligence approaches. So more generally, I mean, I, I said this particular blob is one thing that we see when we look at the galactic center, but this general picture that you can look at regions of high dark matter density and try to look for particles produced by their collisions or decays is a much more general program. And as I mentioned, we have existing telescopes spanning the whole energy range, but over the next 10 years, there are proposals or in some cases construction underway for telescopes that will dramatically improve our sensitivity. This lower image is an artist's impression, a sketch of what the uh, Cherenkov telescope array, which is a big next generation ground-based gamma ray telescope uh, will look like when constructed. And, uh, and, and then and at lower energies, you have you need space-based experiments to see the gamma rays. And there are many ideas for new technologies in this band as well. Just as an example of what we'll be able to do if these improved telescopes actually get built, as I mentioned, there are classes of dark matter models where the annihilation actually, um, where, where there's a clean prediction for the annihilation rate, because the annihilation rate determines how much dark matter you have in the present day universe. So in these models, what happens is there was more dark matter early on, most of it annihilated away. What we see left is the residual. So this tells you, so we can measure the amount of dark matter today, and that tells you exactly how efficient this annihilation process must be. So this plot is showing that annihilation rate on the y-axis and the dark matter mass on the x-axis. And this orange line is that benchmark that would give you the right amount of dark matter in the present day purely through this annihilation process. Now, like, this is not a guarantee. The dark matter might've gotten its abundance a different way. But if you were to see a signal corresponding to this line, you would immediately have like a nice simple explanation for why we see the amount of dark matter that we do in the universe. This, and th this is for annihilation, this is some specific standard model final states, but the answer is not very different for annihilation than other standard model particles. This pink region shows the region that we can currently test with current experiments. So we're probing and the mass scale here is GeV. So it's basically in units of the proton mass. So everything, so at the moment, we're testing this scenario, this thermorelic benchmark cross section up to mass scales of about 100 GeV. If we finish building CTA and another proposed telescope, which is called the Southern Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory, we'll be able to do something comparable to this green line, which would allow us to probe this thermal scenario up to um, mass scales uh, several times, 10,000 times the mass of the proton. So up to several tens of TeV. This would, this would represent an increase in, uh, in our sensitivity to the mass of this scenario by nearly three orders of magnitude. And this is something that we could do in five to 10 years. Another class of searches that I'm really excited about in which the first dedicated experiment is a balloon experiment called GAPS that is going to fly next year. So we should get results with that very soon is looking for anti-deuterons and anti-helium. So I told you that we could look at you know, protons, electrons, photons, neutrinos, 
and they're antiparticles. Well, but there are also heavier nuclei that are stable, as, as we know, you know, our whole chemistry is, bu is built on, sta on stable states with more than one proton. And um, so you can look for anti-deuterons, which is an, an anti-helium, which have never been detected at low energies, and there's thought to be basically no astrophysical background. So if we saw any detection of one of these, that would be transformative. Okay, so, but you might ask, all right, so you've got this great plan. You, know, you can build these amazing telescopes. You can push the sensitivity forward by you know, huge factors in mass and in reach over the next decade. But what if dark matter doesn't interact with known particles except through gravity? You know, sometimes we call this the nightmare scenario. I mean, what if the gravitational interactions are all there is to find? Well, then it's still true that astrophysics and cosmology are the best tools we have to learn about dark matter. They're, what, they're how we've learned everything we currently know about dark matter. So our best tool is to study in more depth this pattern of how dark matter is distributed throughout the cosmos. And this is a search that we run in parallel with the other kinds of searches that I talked about. We can already say the dark matter can't be too light because if it was, it would be ruled out because its wavelength would be larger than the smallest galaxies. You sort of couldn't fit the dark matter inside galaxies. At the other end of the mass spectrum, I talked about tiny black holes as a dark matter candidate. Well, if those black holes are much heavier than stuff in the asteroid belt, then we would actually be able to see their, signa their, their presence through gravitational lensing. Uh, we don't see that, so we can exclude that possibility. So the sort of bounds on how heavy or how light dark matter could be come from exactly these kinds of observations of the dark matter distribution. We said earlier that dark matter is this too fast moving, doesn't form the cosmic web. And as I said before, it's even possible that dark matter could have its own forces, that dark matter particles could interact with each other. And if that was the case, then it could leave characteristic signatures in the dark matter distribution in the same way that because the standard model and dark matter have different interactions, the standard model you know, forms spiral galaxies and dark matter, as far as we can tell, does not. So this is, this is a, a, a whole set of searches that I haven't talked much about, but is running in parallel with these searches for light from dark matter um, and, and which may be the thing that gives us our, big, our next big clue to the properties of dark matter. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and take questions. The basic problem that we have here is that dark matter is more than 80% of the matter in the universe, and we don't know what it is, although we know some things about it. We know that it's you know, not too strongly interacting. It looks pretty close to being collisionless. It's relatively slow moving. It forms large halos around galaxies, and we believe forms like the invisible backing to the whole visible structure of the universe that we see. There's a huge amount of ideas for what dark matter could be that spans an enormous range of masses and interaction strengths, but we hope to narrow down the possibilities by searching for the non-gravitational interactions of dark matter with other particles, which can differ extremely widely between models. So they're potentially a good discriminant. One promising route for isolating those signals is to look for visible particles produced by dark matter interactions and their effects. And I gave you an example of looking in our galaxy and also an example of looking at the effects through a cosmic history. But we probably haven't found such a signal so far, although they also mentioned there are some hints of possible signals that are certainly telling us about something that we need to understand, even if, you know, may maybe the smart money is that what, we're, what they're telling us about is new and exciting astrophysics rather than about the properties of dark matter. But the dark matter hypothesis is not ruled out. And going forward, there's an ambitious program to search for dark matter signals in the sky. And I'm happy to talk about this more in the questions if people are interested, both by testing for visible particles from dark matter interactions and for just doing improved measurements of the dark matter distribution to nail down its properties from that perspective. So it should be an exciting next decade. And I'll, thanks very much for listening and I'll take questions. Thank you, Tracy. And thanks also for connecting uh, in many ways to previous talks we've had in this series with respect to the CMB, for instance, and inflation or also structure formation just last week. So that brought it all together nicely. Yes, yeah, so I did. People who have watched the whole series, some of the things in my talk, well, you, you will have seen them before. But yeah, uh, yeah this, this, this cosmological story is very beautiful and interconnected. All right, well, so yeah, one uh, similarly enthusiastic statement from Sergey in the chat, very nice and informative talk. So I think we'll go right to the chat and take a couple of questions there first before going to the first raised hand. So I'd like to start at the end of the thread in the chat, actually, um, because there's a question from Ludwig Klein there, which addresses sort of the, the structure of dark matter halos. And you can tell us a bit more about that, so the, the density profile. So he asks, how can the gamma ray signal from dark matter come from the center of the galaxy if the dark matter is in the halo rather than concentrated around the center? So please, Tracy. 
<laughs> yeah, so um, so that's a great question. In our, right, so, so yeah, so let me say a few things. So first, in our picture of dark matter halos, they don't have holes in the center. So they extend out a long way, but they also extend all the way into the center. And actually we expect the density to be largest in the center, again, just due to gravitational attraction. And then it falls off smoothly as you move away from the center. Now, the exact question of how fast does the density fall off as you move away from the center is one of our major, is, is a major uncertainty for all these kinds of searches from the galactic center that I talked about. If something like the galactic center excess actually is coming from dark matter, that will be our, by far our best measurement of how the dark matter halo behaves in the center. But that means that that uncertainty means that it's a bit hard to say that like the steeply rising profile towards the center is the confirmation of a prediction. So just to give you an example, in simulations where we only take dark matter into account, so we pretend that we the dark matter is the only matter in the universe, there is no visible matter, there's no stars, no galaxies, and we ask how would the halos form in that case, then we typically find that the dark matter density should rise towards the center roughly inversely with distance from the center. So, you know, if the uh, and, and, then, and then at some point it will saturate. But once we put ordinary matter into the picture, then in the centers of galaxies, um, there are supernovae going off, stars are exploding, and those explosions can transport a lot of gas and other matter out of the center of the galaxy. And that material will pull the dark matter along with it just through gravitational effects. So that effect tends to disrupt these regions of high dark matter density at the center of the galaxy. It tends to redistribute the dark matter. And their effect thus tends to be to sort of flatten the density distribution towards the center of the galaxy. So the dark matter density rises into some point and then it goes somewhat flat, but it's not a hole. So you can still look at the inner galaxy and hope to see signals from dark matter there. But exactly like where that flattening happens and, and how severe it is, is pretty hard to predict accurately from simulations. And we don't have great observational constraints on it because um, partly just because we, I, and, and, and that's partly just because the galactic center is some distance away and, and partly because in the galactic center, we have a lot of visible matter as well as dark matter. So if you want to figure out what the dark matter is doing, you have to be able to factor out the effects of the visible matter. And that's challenging. But this is a place where if we could get better measurements of how dark matter is distributed in our galaxy, that might allow us to just immediately say, all right, the galactic center excess is definitely not coming from dark matter. The morphology is wrong. Um, or, you know, it, if, if they did line up, it would give you more evidence that the galactic center excess was coming from something like that. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, those of you who are interested in this, I could go and read up about cuspy or accord dark matter halos and modifications to the Navarro being quite profound. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's right. That's and, and I, and I would also, well, I, I'll actually just say one other thing, which is that I talked about baryonic processes, like ordinary matter changing how the dark matter is distributed towards the center of the halo. But um, if dark matter had its own forces and its own self interactions, then that would also change its distribution at the center of the halo. Because then once the dark matter gets dense enough, it would behave more like a fluid with frequent collisions. And that would change how it's distributed. So, and there actually, like there is evidence of cause in um, the halos of dark matter density profile, not so much in our galaxy, but in smaller, um, but, but in dwarf galaxies with fewer baryons where we can try to measure the dark matter density more accurately. We do see evidence for, for this kind of flattening in the density profile. So the question then is, okay, is this telling us that ordinary matter flattened out the density profile, or is this telling us something about the dark matter physics? And so there's a very like ongoing active program of research to try to disentangle these effects and understand you know, if dark matter did have its own interactions and interacts with its own forces, like how would we know? What would the signatures of that look like in the density distribution? Okay, um, so the other one is also sort of setting the stage for some of the history you told us. So right at the top of the chat this time, Hugh Hudson asks, there were many papers on galaxy rotation, uh, for instance, yeah, Burbage, Burbage and Pendergast, Pendergast um, and the main point here, some of this work being done prior to the Rubin et al. Yeah. analysis okay. you mentioned and how come they did not draw the same conclusions necessarily. Yeah, so I, I will say first of all, like I am not an expert on the history of science in this area, but I was, I, I was, act we actually have a visiting um, scholar at MIT at the moment um, who's just written a book co about called um, like how, I think it's like how dark matter came to matter, something like this, which goes into this history and about how the observations sort of got put together to, to come to this hypothesis that maybe there was some additional dark matter component 
in the outskirts of Halos. And he attributes the that hypothesis in part to just to to in the in the 60s and 70s an increasing like flux of people trained as physicists moving into astronomy and astrophysics and to just like crosstalk and discussion between these communities because yeah so I mean that right I I, I did give you the simplified version of, of the history, but it sounds like at least for a while there, I mean, it, it also took a while for people to connect the um, the galaxy cluster mass measurements, which had been around for a very long time to the question of, oh, could, you know, if, if, if we're systematically getting the galaxy cluster masses wrong, could this have something to do with, with the rotation curves being weird? I, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, I, I guess on the, I'll, I'll punt a little bit on that question and say that, I'm, I'm not an expert on the history, but at least someone who I know is an expert ha has told me that he felt that like in this sort of 60s and 70s, there was actually quite a big movement of physicists towards astrophysics and cosmology. And once those communities started talking to each other, he he attributes that in part to, to where this hypothesis came from. But in yeah, some sense, not, 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 not an expert. So want to give that caveat. In some sense, a beautiful example of we try what we try to make happen here at ECI by bringing together people from various sectors to talk together and make connections they otherwise wouldn't have. <laughs> so Ludwig says isn't a simple answer the fact that the rotation curves at Rubens time were measurable at larger distances before. Yeah, so I like I, I don't know the details of what was in the earlier papers, but yeah, I think it's also true that the in the 70s you started to get rotation curves from a larger from a larger ensemble of systems with better accuracy and out to larger distances. So I, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, I mean, it's very easy to sort of summarize the history as like, oh, and then somebody did this measurement and everyone agreed. But of course, that's never how it happens, right? Like, you know, you get initial measurements, which are sort of, you know, which are sort of fuzzy and maybe the error bars are big and maybe the statistics aren't great. And then you get, you know, more measurements and out of further distances. And, and, and over time, the community starts to become convinced that, huh, maybe, maybe there's actually something here there, but it's not, it's not a step function. So yeah, uh, Ludwig, you may, you may very you may very well be right that that was the thing that made the difference being able to measure it further out. Okay, let's take the question from Don Ellison now, who has raised his hand. Don, please, you should be able to go ahead and speak. I see. Yeah, your microphone's good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Very nice talk. Uh, um, you didn't mention give us any ideas of where dark matter actually came from, and is there any? thoughts as to the origin of dark matter and dark energy being connected in any way? Yeah, so um, there are lots of ideas for where dark matter could have come from. The, the only, yeah, I guess the only one that I mentioned a little bit was that if dark matter has significant interactions with the standard model, dark matter would actually first get generated just from standard model particles colliding with each other in the early universe producing dark matter, and then it would get depleted by the reverse process by annihilation. So that's sort of the thermal relic scenario. And I mean, that's, you know, we tend to like that scenario because it's very predictive. It, you know, it ties the abundance of dark matter today just to how it interacts with the standard model. And you don't have to worry about the initial condition because the interactions with the standard model will drive it to an equilibrium abundance, which you can predict just from knowing the standard model. Um, so, so, you know, so like that, that's one scenario, but there are, there are other possibilities if dark matter is like some ultralight scalar, it, it could be, um, then the abundance may basically come from an initial condition for that scalar field in the early universe. If dark matter was primordial black holes, like I mentioned, you have to make them by some violent event in the early universe in inflation or at the or at the phase transition. So there are there are lots of ideas for how you got this stuff in the first place. The question about could there be a connection to dark energy? So people do think about scenarios where there is a connection between dark matter and dark energy. I would say that in most dark matter scenarios, there's not an obvious connection to dark energy. Um, and, and partly that's because the problems are, are different in that in the case of dark matter, it seems that we can just, you know, we've seen lots of things with the equation of state of matter, right? It seems like we can explain it pretty well just by saying, okay, there's some extra component in the universe, that there's some extra inert particle that we haven't found yet. So in that sense, like it's an, it's an easy problem in some sense, like we don't need to, I mean, this might not be the right answer, 
but you can imagine answers to the dark matter problem that don't require like any revision of our understanding of the laws of physics. They, they, you, you just need to be the, some extra inert particle like a heavy neutrino that we haven't discovered yet. Um, whereas dark energy seems like a much harder problem in the sense that it, the, the size of the dark energy component is very dramatically inconsistent with what we would have naively predicted from quantum field theory, which suggests that there is something that we are missing when we think about, like when we think about quantum field theory and when we think about these predictions. So I mean, in, in some sense, you know, like if, if I was offered all right, you can have an answer to any one physics problem that you care about. And like, you can either know all the physics going into dark energy, or you can know what dark matter is. Even though I work on dark matter all the time, I would probably pick dark energy for that one. But I mean, dark matter seems to me like a, a problem that will we have some more handles to make progress. But, uh, but, but in some sense, dark energy seems much harder. Um, but that's it. There, there are scenarios where, you know, you, you, you can also look for like signatures of interactions between dark matter and dark energy, like that could also change the evolution of the universe in interesting ways. So there could be a connection, but there's not an obvious reason to think that they could be, that they should be connected. Thanks, Tracy. Now, um, next question in the chat before we go back to a raised hand again is from Jean Schneider who asks, uh, does MOND explain, so modified Newtonian dynamics, explain the arcs of galaxies? So I guess this, the question is a bit terse, but it probably is the question of whether strong gravitational lensing is a phenomenon you'd expect under MOND. Um, I, right, so I, I think, so, so okay, so, so modified, modified Newtonian gravity was, is, primarily tries to explain like the observed rotation curves and the evidence that I attributed to having like large halos around galaxies. Um, so I, so, so it's certainly true that like in a Mon-like theory, a lot of gravity is still the same. You would still expect there to be gravitational lensing. You would still expect background objects like background galaxies to be lensed by, by stuff that is along the line of sight. There are actually some significant constraints on modified gravity theories from things like the fact that gravitational waves and light from distant events arrived at Earth at very close to the same time. That, that allows you to remove a lot of possible modifications to gravity. So there, there, there could be like subtle differences, like under theories where you modify gravity, you change things like the arrival time or the exact details of the lensing, but just the presence of gravitational lensing that would give you, you know, arcs that distort background galaxies. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you would, the, the observation of those doesn't falsify MOND. Um, the, the specific thing in the, so the bullet cluster is, of course, the, the example where I showed some actual, you know, like some, uh, uh, an analysis that depended on gravitational lensing in that talk. And in that case, I think it's, it's some, I mean, I, I think that the answer there for mon proponents is like, maybe there is some like non-luminous matter that we're not seeing in these galaxies, but it doesn't have to be non in these galaxy clusters that is responsible for those gravitational lensing signals. But maybe it's not like a new particle, it's not non-baryonic. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing that is explaining the rotation curves and the bulk of the dark matter. So like, I don't think Mond has a great explanation for things like the bullet cluster, but it's not obvious that it's strictly inconsistent. The, yeah, so um, as far as I know, the biggest challenges to Mond are uh, cosmology, like getting the CMB right and structure formation right. Like Mond itself is an effective theory, so you need to think about, okay, what sort of like larger theory would it be embedded into that would describe what happens in the early universe, how you get that power spectrum of the CMB, how you get the subsequent structure formation. There have been some proposals recently for models that seem to get closer to doing that than, than anything that I've seen before, which is impressive because, I mean, this is the big, the, the this, this has always been the thing that is hardest for those models to manage. Um, it, a lot of the possible refinements though do end up effectively like adding a new field or a new particle that basically plays the role of dark matter for the purposes of cosmology. So, you know, MOND is a large class of possibilities. As far as I know, the most sort of, the, the things that are hardest for it to explain are the early universe cosmology. Um, the most sort of direct tests of MOND in our galaxy are things that like look at the, try to measure the distribution of dark matter 
or equivalently the gravitational potential of our galaxy um, in, in detail and ask if they're consistent with MOND. And some of these seem to like slightly disfavor MOND. But yeah, I mean, the, the real challenge is just like the difficulty in making a model that gets all the cosmological observations right. Hope, hope that was fun. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. Um, two more in the chat. Uh, I think there's just been a follow up uh, on MOND um, in the chat as well. But uh, let's first deal with those which have come in before. So John Cooper asked a question in the chat and also raised his hand. I don't know, John, would you like to speak up? Maybe Vili, you can unmute John and John can pose his question directly. You should be able to go now, John. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, so my question in the chat was, uh, you know, you mentioned primordial black holes as being one model for dark matter. Could you uh, maybe expand on that? You know, some connection to singularities and the absence of the other forces other than gravity? Yeah, so I actually have a cute little cartoon about primordial black holes as dark matter. So, um, right. So the idea here is that if you, so black holes can certainly carry electric charge, but if you start out with a positively charged black hole, it will attract negative charge matter to it, like it will absorb a lot of electrons from the environment until it's neutral or very close to neutral. So then you have something that has a lot of mass that has no electric charge. And that can, if formed early enough, and if it's small enough, this can behave like a dark matter candidate. So, well, okay, I guess it can behave like a dark matter candidate, even if it's larger, just we would have already seen its signatures in that case. Now, the way that we normally form black holes is by having stars collapse. This won't work for dark matter because we know that dark matter was already around when the universe was only 400,000 years old and uh, the first stars didn't form until the universe was 100 million years old. So if you want to do black holes as dark matter, you have to wait to make black holes very early in the universe's history before there were any stars around, which is potentially possible. It could happen um, during the inflation epoch, which I guess you've had a previous seminar about or it could happen if there was say some kind of a violent early universe phase transition. So that's, um, yeah, so, and, and yeah, so I mean, I, I guess another way to say this is, so things that interact effectively only by gravity, which primordial black holes are, uh, you know, are, are very close to collisionless. Things that are, I mean, so black hole, so right, let, let, me, let me just say another thing, which is, when you look at the bullet cluster analyses and we look at those regions where I said, okay, well, the mass is here, that's where the dark matter blobs are, the stars of the clusters are also in those blobs. And the reason that the stars of the clusters are in those blobs is because stars more or less only interact with other stars gravitationally. Like to have non-gravitational interactions, they need to get really close to each other. Um, and for them to get that close to each other, each other is just extremely unlikely if their density is relatively low. So it's the same for dark matter as black holes. Like, yes, if you've got two primordial black holes, you know, close to each other, they would have, they would have interesting interactions, but, but, you know, they're, they're separated by such large, they're separated by sufficient distances that those head-on collisions are really rare. And then they basically just act as collisionless particles. So, yeah, so, so that's the, that's basically why they work as a dark matter candidate. This plot is showing the fraction of dark matter that could be in the form of primordial black holes as a function of the mass of the black holes. And uh, these different colored lines are showing what you can exclude. So the colored regions are ruled out. The colored regions that have dash boundaries have been claimed to be ruled out, but the author of this review did not believe them because of uh, various criticisms of those constraints. So basically, if the black holes are heavier than about 10 to the 23 grams, which is like the heavy stuff in the asteroid belt, um, it's hard for them to be all of the dark matter because we would have already seen them by all of these probes, most of which are looking for gravitational bending of the light around the primordial black holes. And if it's too light, if it's below about 10 to the 17 grams, the black holes would actually be decaying dark matter because they evaporate by a Hawking radiation. And you can look for those decay signals in exactly the way that I described in this talk. And that tells you that it can't be below about 10 to the 17 grams. But if you made a lot of primordial black holes in this window, which corresponds to about the window of masses of things in the asteroid belt, then, um, then, then that could be the dark matter that only interacts with gravity to a good approximation. Like they could pick up charge occasionally, but would quickly become uncharged from interactions with the rest of the cosmos. And they're small enough and compact enough that they just don't interact with each other very much. 
Great. Okay, we should slowly but surely wrap up, but I'll take one more. Uh, this is again from Ludwig Klein, um, to do with dark matter halo formation. Uh, so about two thirds up the chat. What prevents dark matter halos from collapsing? In ordinary matter, it's pressure, so eventually electromagnetic interactions. How does pressure work with dark matter? Yeah, no, good. Uh, good. This is a really good question. So, because the answer is if you wait long enough, the dark matter halos will actually collapse. There's, um, so the, the zero thought of thing is the thing that stops dark matter halos from collapsing is just angular momentum. Like if it, for the same, it's the same reason that the planets haven't fallen into the sun yet, despite, you know, the, the, pl the planets are on orbits around the sun. It's the, it's the angular momentum that keeps them on their orbits rather than just falling directly into the sun. Um, similarly, if you've got a dark matter particle, you know, orbiting around the outskirts of our galaxy, um, the zero thought of it doesn't really collide with other things, so it will just stay on that orbit. Uh, and not collapse. That's it. Of course, you do have occasional collisions where dark matter particles get, get close to each other. And those collisions can redistribute energy between the dark, just gravitational interactions. And those collisions can redistribute energy between the dark matter particles and some particles can sometimes get unbound from the halo. And this leads to what's called a gravithermal instability, where if the particles with the most energy evaporate from the halo, the remaining ones would redistribute their energy and the halo will shrink. Uh, shrinking makes it hotter, which means that more particles evaporate after uh, evaporate off the edges. And so over time, the halo will gradually contract and, and end up collapsing down to this uh, dense core and eventually a black hole if you wait long enough. However, the density of dark matter in the halos is low enough and gravitational interactions are weak enough that the time scale for this to happen is much, much longer than the present age of the universe. So it's like, yes, if you wait long enough, the dark matter halos will collapse, but you would need to wait, wait for a really long time. This is another case where if dark matter has interactions beyond gravity, so dark matter particles can exchange energy and methods other than by gravity, then you can speed up this process by a lot. And that's another you know, possible diagnostic of dark matter self-interactions. If, if under circumstances you could see the dark matter halos have actually collapsed, then, then that could be a clue. Thanks, Tracy. Um, thanks for being with us today. This brings us more or less to the close. And I guess I can just say that you won't have to wait that long for the next Game Changer seminar. That's already going to be next week. Um, topic this time being, or next time being the remaining 16%. So the Cosmic Baryon budget. Uh, our guest next week will be Chui Wei. And uh, time as usual, 1700 Central European Standard Time, or at that point, I guess, 1700 Central European Time, because we'll have switched to winter time at that point. All right, good evening, uh, good night or good good rest of the day, everyone. Tracy, thanks again, and uh, um, hopefully see you some other time. Thanks again. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for the great questions. And yeah, if you have questions that we didn't get to, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm, and I'm happy to chat more. But um, yeah, take care.